Christ's birth and his coming to the to be among us. Uh, we're looking at from a little bit different direction this morning. I'm going to be reading the first chapter of John, the first 13 verses, where the Word became flesh, in the form of a baby in Bethlehem. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light, which enlightens everyone and was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus is the light of the world. But not all people accept him. And that's what John reports at the beginning of his gospel. He came into the world as a human baby. Because he did, those who did accept him, John says, have the power to become children of God. 
Now, I have heard teaching and have heard people say, I, and I think it comes from the Methodist seminaries, maybe, maybe not, but um, if you ask, were to ask a lot of people who are the children of God, how do you think they would answer? Ever heard of all God's children? Ever heard of all children that are from God? And all are God's children. It's a different statement to say that you're talking about all God's children or to say that you're saying that everyone is a child of God. Scripture doesn't teach that. It is taught, it is said, it is believed. But Scripture says that those who are children of God are the ones who trust and believe in Jesus, trust in his name. That at that point, which comes at baptism, we're going to talk more about baptism next week, but at that point that we surrender ourselves to Jesus, we give him our life, our heart, and our loyalty, we are adopted into the family of God. And that's, that's the language scripture uses. Jesus said, or John said in his gospel, he gives us power to become. Um, Paul, in talking to the Galatians, uh, this is from the first part of chapter four of Galatians, talks about what it means to be a child of God. My point is this, heirs, as long as they are minors, are no better than slaves. Though they are the owners of all the property, they remain under guardians and trustees until the date set by the father. So with us, while we were minors, we were enslaved to the elemental spirits. And Jesus told the religious leaders that the, they were sons of Satan, that uh, they were not sons of God, but they were sons of Satan. So with us, while we were minors, we were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child, and if a child, then also an heir through God. When we surrender our lives to God, we become children of God. Um, I love having children in church because they, they so adequately help us to remember what it means to be a child. Uh, I have told any of the church leaders that work with children that our main task, especially when they're young, is to help them realize that church is where they're loved. This, we come together as Christians and this is where they're in because when they get, you know, in their 20s or so, often the world catches up to them and, and uh, it's often, I don't know if you've noticed this, but the world is often not kind to us. And it's great to know that they can come to where they are loved, which I think is why in the Old Testament it says, bring them up in the way that they should go, and when they are old, they will not stray from them. But children also teach us what it means to be a child of God. They don't always get it right. Did you notice that? Sometimes children insist on having their own way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes children get selfish. They won't share their toys. And if you thought I was talking about the ones under 21, who am I really talking about? We have to learn as children of God how to be the kind of children God wants us to be. <coughs> Jesus did it opposite the way we do. Jesus was God, is God, will be God, but he 
he came and was born in human form. And he came to live life in such a way that we would have an example of what it is like to live as a child of God. And he gave just one command to his, his disciples, didn't he? And what was that? Love one another. And what's the most important thing we teach our children? Love. Starting in your family, right? Love your brothers and your sisters. Love one another. When he says that in Scripture, it's not, I want you to go feed the hungry. It's not, oh, I want, I want you to, you know, send, send lunches to the kids at school. I want you to go bring a blanket to this person that's homeless. He doesn't say all that. Yes, he does say uh, in that famous passage in Matthew that he will find some who have fed the hungry and have nursed the sick and have visited those in prison and have clothed the naked. He does say that, but if you read that passage, it says, when you've done it to the least of these, your brothers, and in the Greek that means brothers and sisters, you've done it to me. We're called, we see in, the, in, in Acts, in Acts, especially at the end of Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, we see where they're taking care of each other's needs. In Acts chapter 4, it says that those who had property sold it so that no one had any needs in the family of God. And the early church was known in the pagan world by the word, see how they love one another. And I believe that with God's children and as God's children, he is more than anything else trying to teach us to love one another. We're also told in scripture, if we can't love our brother or sister who we can see, how can we love God who we can't see? So our lives then, our chief function, our chief goal is to learn how to love one another, to take care of each other as brothers and sisters in the same family. Now, of what advantage is it to be a child of God? I just uh, recently bought a book, which I'm going to start using tomorrow, actually, where Charles Spurgeon has written a book for that gives a different promise of God every day. 365 days. A different promise of God. As God's children... We receive promises, right? Promises of how God's going to take care of us. How God's always going to be there for us. How he's watchful over us. And even when we do endure hardship, which we're told we will. You know, I, I have children. There were times when I bailed them out. I'm sure most of you who are parents have done that for your children. But there were other times when I didn't bail them out because I knew that if they were ever going to be able to take care of themselves, if they were going to be whole, they needed to learn how to work through adversity. God's that way with us. But we have the promise that he will never put more, he will never allow more on us than we can handle. You know, I can, I can remember without my child knowing it when I wrote checks to pay the rent that I knew they couldn't pay. And lots of times, God's that way. He's there paying our way. He's there doing what needs to be done <coughs> because we're his children and he loves us. So we can all of these privileges of being part of the family of God. But we also have the responsibility. And we can't forget that. It's not just what we gain in privileges. It's also the responsibility to learn to love one another. To take what he's given us and use it for each other's sake. 
watch out for each other. And there was an outpouring of that here Thursday. I saw it. I was responding to someone who gave of themselves for the sake of others and others coming in response to that. Loving each other. And you know what? None of us are perfect at that yet. We're still learning. If we can't love each other, we can't love God. And we can't fully do it off the bat. Never saw a child come out of the womb that knew all the ways to take care of themselves, right? And to be a productive member of society. Took time. And it's the same is true for us. But he's with us. He's watching us. We are his children. And sometimes we forget what a blessing that is. What a privilege it is. Made possible by the coming of a baby in a manger who ended up on a cross. But it wasn't the end. His love brought him up from the tomb. It will bring us out of all that we might get into in this crazy world, this crazy broken world. It will be the love of God for us that delivers us as it raised Jesus from the grave. Amen? Amen. That love is the light of the world, by the way. That's why I forgot about using that as a sermon title. It is that light that came into the world that teaches us that love. And let's sing number, number 246. As we prepare to share that love going from this place and let the world see how much we love God and love one another.
Um, or you might want to take one with your own phone or something. Because it is so beautiful in here and it's a great place to be. As Judy said, it's coming down. And Judy said it's coming down. <laughs> and, and Milton said the same thing. <laughs> okay. Let us go forth into a broken world to bring the light of Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.